has started. In the last weeks, we've seen six nations sign MOUs with the movement. Since Satguru flagged off yesterday in London, there's been an overwhelming support across the globe for the Save Soul movement. We'd like to show you a short video now showing some of these moments. It's a great pleasure for me, these beautiful nations, these uh, pearls uh, of uh, the ocean, which are the Caribbean nations, are going for this fast. Soil. soil is not a separate subject. If we are interested in health, if we are interested in agriculture, if we are interested in the well-being of the citizens of today and the unborn child of tomorrow, Attending to soil right now, attending to the soil biodiversity right now, this is a, a must-do thing in our life. Soil. The only thing that we hated about you were you were on the opposite side. <laughs> always. <laughs> but no, but always. We couldn't help loving you. We are at the cusp of time right now, if we act now, if you bring in the policies and start implementing this, in the next 12 to 15 years, we can make a significant turnaround. So, this memorandum of understanding that we are signing, it will also bring some technical assistance to the Caribbean region. This is a historic moment because here is the first step to turn around. Sadhguru, welcome to The Daily Show. Wonderful. <laughs> I know that we also are facing a soil crisis where some people are estimating that if we do nothing, in 50 years' time, we may not be able to grow anything because we may run out of soil, which, forgive my ignorance, I did not know that soil is even something that we could run out of. 
Uh, the thing is, uh, this has happened in the last fifty to hundred years of industrialized farming, that the organic content in the soil is going away because there's no replenishment. Are you getting any signs that governments are, are enthusiastic to try and do something about this? See, in the last two years, I've been talking to various uh, country heads, various politicians, political parties. We have written to 730 political parties on the planet to make sure that they include soil and ecology as a part of their election manifestos, as their political philosophy. Whatever they believe in, right, left, center, whatever they are, soil is one thing which is a common factor for all of us. We're always looking at what divides us. It's time, if you don't understand the consciousness of this cosmos and stuff like that, at least you understand you come from the soil, you live off the soil, when you die, you go back to the soil. <laughs> that much you get it. So this is something that you're very concerned about, and rightly so, that there's a, a problem with the topsoil in America. Uh, Fifty percent of the American farmers have not seen a dollar in the last twelve years, and the highest suicide rate among all professions is among the farming community in the United States. I don't want to be that one who didn't care enough to do something which matters because right now we are consuming the soil and food that belongs to the unborn child. This is a crime against humanity. I hear you. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. His spiritualist techniques have gained him a following of millions. I mean, we welcome Sadhguru. Good morning, Chief. In the first 15 to 18 inches of the soil, you are a consequence of that. Yeah. Even now, over 60 percent of your body is actually microbial life. Only 40 percent is of parental genetics. Mm. So, ignoring that, thinking you can destroy the soil and live happily upon this planet is just a pipe dream. It's not going to work. And you were interviewed by Trevor Noah, who is the darling of the left. And uh, then you were interviewed by Joe Rogan, uh, who is the beloved of the right recently. So is it Sadhguru who unites the left and the right or the very important issue? Of soil. Soil right? unites left, right, center, everybody <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguruji has said it's important for all, particularly leaders whose decisions affect millions of lives, to be conscious and inclusive. And this is where each one of us can help. How are we going to make farming more respectable and more, uh, more profitable as well? When I go to the farmer, we are only talking economics. How to enhance your income? And if you want next generation to go for agriculture, this is the only solution that he must make more money than a lawyer or a doctor or a IT professional. Wish you a very uh, successful, joyful, uh, exhilarating uh, journey. I will take care of the exhilaration and joy myself. Yeah. What I need is, next hundred days from 21st of March, we want the whole world to talk about soil. <laughs> We're looking at how can we involve women as leaders in climate action. When uh, this motorcycle journey is being flagged off, we are uh, making a seven or eight year old little girl flag it off. Unfortunately, adults have come to this place where if I see him, I will see what country he belongs to, what race is he, what religion is he, what caste is he, what creed is he, all this nonsense. But when they see a child, a girl child, I believe people's hearts will become a little more tender. If you want to say, I love you to your child, you must just say, save soil, because it is a more committed way of saying, I love you. Sadhguru's gift of making a systemic issue so personal to each and one of us of this room and the generational responsibility so relevant for everyone. You know, it's shocking and unnerving. We need to take this up and save the soil and act more sensibly and responsibly. It's an extraordinary campaign. It echoes what we in the Commonwealth 
have been aspiring to do for a number of years. Heads. Heads. You win the toss. Uh, Batting or bowling? <laughs> I want to go to the pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> Gave me a good view, that. Take a picture the next to Kapil. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to London. You are probably one of the most famous Indians and what you're doing today is really important because people like you who have a wonderful following of millions and millions of people and what you're doing with that is so important with saving the soil. If only they could have seen this at COP26. So I think what you're doing is phenomenally important. You must write to the Prime Minister, save soil, okay? All the children, say, save soil.
चपकपड़ो सिर चोटी आनी कया में पांच चोर है पांच के पकड़ो सिर चोटी पांच के मार पच सुबस कर ले जत जानो तरे नजबोती पांच के मार पच सुबस कर ले जत जानो तरे नजबोती अरे गुरु नाम तो भज ले प्राणी और बात सब झूठी हर बज हीरा पर रख ले समझ पकड़ तेरी नजबूटी हर बज हर बज हीरा पर रख ले समझ पकड़ तेरी नजबूटी अरे गुरु नाम दो भज ले रे प्राणी और बात सब झूठी अरे गुरु नाम दो भज ले रे प्राणी और बात सब झूठी our distinguished guests onto the stage to get you all ready we thought we'd play a short video from the London flag off event at the Exile Centre on Saturday this many people 6,000 people with today's technology available various platforms available if you make up your mind, you yourself can reach three to four million people, yes or no? So now, when you say such a big yes, now the question is only will you do it or not? Will you make it happen? In case, in case I don't make it, you must make it happen. The young people here should stand up and make it happen. It's not about the motorcycle, it's not about the journey, it's not about the song, it is about moving people on the planet. Make it happen, huh? Rang mahal mein, ajab shahar mein, aja re hansa bhai, mirgun raja pe, सिरगुण से जब छाई रंग महल में अजब शहर में आ जा रे हम सा भाई निर्गुण राजा पे सिरगुण से जब छाई हाँ हाँ सिरगुण से जब छाई Mirgun ne raja pe, mirgun ne 
gotta stay the way For all the kids that are gonna come along Good soil is the way Not many a chance we got Just one that comes away Let's come together and sing along Say la 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 Hebben we er een beetje zin in? Ja! Nee, nee, nee. Het is, ik snap, het is even een tijdje geleden dat we events hebben gehad. Dus ik probeer het gewoon nog een keer. Uh, en ik zal het ook in Engels uh, doen voor de mensen die daar behoefte uh, aan hebben. Are you looking forward? Yeah! Oké. Okay. Welcome on this, uh, well, I can say conscious planet. A small little planet we're right here. I see a lot of green, which is always a good sign. Uh, this is the Save Soul event in Amsterdam, and um, like I said, I'm delightful to be here. Uh, I'm Giel, I'm like a radio guy, and I'm hosting this podcast about, well, everything we're going to talk about this afternoon. It's called Kukuru, not to, uh, well, not with said guru, of course, but it's Kukuru. <laughs> and um, before I, I will welcome our guests, um, i like to highlight the well, significance uh, of this event, why it is so important. And I think it's good, that's what I really like about this whole organization, that it's like a positive thing. It's not like, oh, doomsday calling, the world's going to an end. Well, actually it is, but it's like a rallying call. It's, there's like a big window of uh, opportunity. And, and with everything we do, what we eat, what we drink, what, well, 
what we, maybe even what we think, uh, we can we can change and we can make it a better way. And that's why, well, the founding father of this organization, Sadhguru, well, you see it over here. Like in 100 days, he will be on his motorcycle and he will uh, get to, uh, well, meet global leaders, influencers, uh, citizens all over the world just to raise awareness and, and, well, to restore a bit of the soul health. So my question is, are we with him? Yeah. Are we with him? Yeah. yeah. Hallelujah. Um, so now is the time. Oh, uh, before I go further on and, and, and introduce a small video, I'd like to say uh, this whole event is supported by the United Nations Convention uh, to Combat Desertification, uh, the World Food Programme, uh, the International Union for uh, Conservation of Nature and a lot of other great organizations. And it's our aim uh, to inspire and to invite people and unite people, like three and a half billion people, uh, because like I said, every action will affect in a good way or in a bad way. This is a fun fact. A teaspoon of soil contains more organis organisms than, uh, than there are humans living on Earth. A teaspoon, yeah? But in the other hand, it uh, well, will take about 500 years to actually form one inch of that topsoil. That's heavy to know, but it is. So, uh, let us now watch a video uh, that explains the science of uh, the purpose of the campaign. Save soil. We are talking about climate change carbon emissions and global warming and various other aspects. But we are not addressing soil. Soil is the habitat upon which zillions of lives thrive. Once there is no richness in soil, then you have forsaken the planet in many ways. Every responsible scientist in the world and the UN agencies are clearly saying we have only 80 to 100 harvests left, that means approximately 45 to 50 years of agricultural soil left on the planet. By 2045, we will be producing 40% less food than what we are producing right now, and our populations will be 9.3 billion people. The food shortages that could manifest in the next 25 years, the consequences of that is unimaginable civil wars will unfold across the world once there is food shortage. What we are facing now is soil extinction. Why is soil becoming extinct? Where is it going away? What is happening to our soil? We must understand if you add organic content to sand, sand will turn into soil. If you remove all organic content from the soil, soil will become sand. In normal agricultural soil, the minimum organic content should be between three to six percent. The most minimum is three percent. At least this minimum to keep the soil alive, to keep the soil as living soil is a must. Agricultural soils across the world, the depletion is so heavy. In most countries, more than fifty percent of the topsoil is already gone in the last hundred years. The nutrient levels have dropped significantly. The level of micronutrients you would get from your food in early twentieth century to what you are getting from the same food now has dropped ninety percent. If you ate one orange in nineteen twenties, what you got from it, now in twenty twenty, if you have to get the same, you will have to eat eight oranges. This is what we have done to our food. Soil is the biggest ecosystem on the planet, and so few people know anything about it. One teaspoon of healthy soil probably contains more microbes than there are people on Earth. The microbial life in the first twelve to fifteen inches of topsoil is the basis of our existence. It is this magic beneath our feet which has produced the life that we are. This first twelve to fifteen inches of soil is the basis of life for eighty-seven percent of life on this planet, including you and me. 
we have to begin to recognize that what we call our soil, Mother Earth, is a living organism. Open soils, ripped open by plowing, open to sunlight, is the basis of destruction of microbial life. So the focus should be on agriculture, the focus should be on seeing that land is under shade as much as possible. Some kind of shade, grasses, herbs, bushes, trees. Conscious Planet is launching Save Soil Movement to bring about a policy change to regenerate soil. As a part of this, <laughs> I'm 65 and I'm riding 30,000 kilometers, a lone motorcycle journey, 30,000 kilometers across 24 nations to activate support from the citizenry to assure the governments long-term investments will be appreciated. So it's extremely important that soil regeneration is enshrined in the policy of every government on the planet. We must change the narrative on the planet that soil is a wealth, a legacy we have received from previous generations and we have to pass it on as living soil for future generations. We are in a cusp of time, if you do the right things now, in the next fifteen to twenty-five years, we can significantly turn this situation around and regenerate the soil. But if we allow this to progress like this for another thirty to forty years, after forty years if we attempt this, then it could take hundred and fifty to two hundred years because that much loss of biodiversity would have happened. From twenty-first of March for one hundred days, the whole world, every human being on the planet should talk soil. So we must hear the word soil, save soil everywhere to see that the narrative on the planet changes towards the most vital aspect of our life, the soil. Each one of you should reach as many people as you can to make this happen. Many global leaders and influencers are already participating in the movement. Be a part of this and let us make it happen. From my part, uh, as much as I can contribute. We are going to save the soil. Do your part. And saving the soils. Our future, our children's future, and our planet's future depend on it. Save the soil. We know what we must do, so let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make, let's it, make it happen. happen. Let's, let's make it happen. happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Welcome to introduce the two guests. Uh, we now warmly invite Her Excellency Mrs. Uh, Rina Sandhu, the ambassador designate of India to the Netherlands, to the stage. This is Rina Sandhu. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure for me to welcome Sadhguru to the Netherlands. As we have seen in this very inspiring video, he is here on a very special mission, uh, which is to raise awareness about soil degradation, about the fact that soil is a very valuable resource that we need to nurture and take care of. Uh, he has He's planning to take this message to 25 countries across 30,000 kilometers. And we are very happy that he has also brought this message to the Netherlands because environment and sustainability are very high on the agenda in the Netherlands as well as in India. It is a global challenge for all of us to ensure that we protect our environment, not only for ourselves, but also for our future generation. And uh, therefore, I feel that this is a very relevant and a very um, significant message that he's bringing to all of us. I would like to wish him all the very best for this endeavor, for his journey. 
and I thank him for being here. I hope you all enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Okay, well, uh, I will do it short because the next two people I hardly have to introduce because you know them all. Um, well, I, w I would like to say, because I didn't know that, she is the ambassador for the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Uh, we all know her as an actress, uh, as a singer maybe, uh, for me as a radio guy, I I'd like that to share with you that she's also a radio host. Give it up for Caris van Houten. Gaat goed, Chris? Ik ben heel zenuwachtig. Ja, dat weet ik. Het gaat heel goed. Het gaat goed. Ik ben maar, in, in een goede presence. Oké. Okay. Maar ik vind wel, want mensen kunnen ook denken: oh ja, Chris die wil even shine of wat dan ook. Maar ik weet, jaren geleden, years ago, we talked about this thing you did in, uh, I think it was Rwanda with the gorillas. That, you, you, what, what, what I would like to say is: you have a lot with nature. Um, yes, although. I'm, I'm scared of a lot of animals. I shouldn't say that. Uh, I love animals, but I, I also can be a little scared. But I, I, um, I went to Rwanda and saw the mountain gorillas there, um, which I thought was pretty... I was a bit scared at the beginning. And then when I saw them, I just the tears just were st streaming down my face because I was like, wait a minute, I, they were here way before me. I'm just visiting. And it was such a um, profound feeling to just be a guest in their natural environment, and um, yeah. Well, good to know, you have a lot of nature. Caris van Houten, thanks for being here. <laughs> and yeah, the other guest, it's like I said before, an absolute honor to invite, uh, well, the one that needs no introduction. I hope that he uh, will love to share some of his uh, pearls of wisdom. Uh, I know we all saw a lot of uh, YouTube videos uh, and other content of this great guy. Give it up for Sadhguru. I have to say, you look a bit like a rock star, or or maybe a rapper or something. That's with with. But those are the the glasses, of course. Yeah, the the, the motorcycle glasses. You're okay. You're okay. <laughs> I'm gonna come even closer. I find it so far. We're so far away from each other. But I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that it will go make that sound again. I don't know if it was me. Okay. Okay. Are we starting? I'm an interviewer now. Okay. I've never done this in my life. Um, I um, I haven't followed you for a long time. I have to say, I just was recent. Like a few months ago, I stumbled upon you, and you said something about children. And it really resonated with me, and then I started following you. And then I got a message saying, do you want to come here? And I immediately said yes, despite my anxiety for big groups and having not been outside for That's two why years. we black them out, you know, you can't see them. <laughs> yeah, but the trick from they're all naked, that doesn't really work for me. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, so I immediately said yes, uh, so basically I'm saying to you, I'm at your service. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Because um, I love this initiative. I think it's an amazing and very touching that you do this, um, this enormous journey um, to save our home. And um, I'm very grateful for you, to you for that. Um, and uh, I guess as a mother of a five-year-old, uh, I don't want to be... I don't want to be the generation later on in a few 20 years where he says, uh, why the fuck didn't you do anything? Why didn't, while it still was still possible, I don't want to be that person. Yeah, well, if you don't do anything. So what, what do you say to these parents that have, that, that, that have to deal with that feeling of, what can we do now? What can we, not only for mothers and fathers, but... Uh, it's not about dealing with that question when it comes after 25 years. 
no matter what you say, it could be too late. It's about having the sense to wake up now and do what's needed. When I say what's needed, every… all the data in the world, all the responsible scientists in the world are clearly pointing out that we are heading in this direction where in a maximum of sixty, sixty-five years, we could barely have agricultural soil left if we don't do anything right now. And by 2045, every responsible scientist is saying that we will be producing forty percent less food than what we have right now. And our populations will be well over nine billion. So, that's not a world you want to live in. That's not a world where you want to leave your boy. Because I want you to just imagine, in this city, let's take this city, it's peaceful and nice right now. If forty percent of the people have not eaten in this city, do you think they will sit in some corners and quietly die? They're going to rip your civilization apart. Your civilization will evaporate in three days of food shortages. Not just civilization, your very humanity will evaporate in three days of food shortages because the chaos that it will create will be such. This is not the first time, it's happened in the past. It has happened in the past. Famines have happened, other things have happened. When food shortages have happened, I'm not saying this just to shock you, but I'm saying this because people are asking me, Sadhguru, why at this stage in your life are you attempting something like this? Thirty thousand kilometers, are you lost? Have you lost your mind? Why I'm doing this is, see if you… if you look at the world, in the last twenty-five years, the area of deserts on the planet has increased by ten percent. Ten percent more desert on the planet. The African… Northern African deserts are about the same or larger than three times the Indian subcontinent. That's not a small bit of area, all right? And it's spreading. In the last twenty years, in India, three hundred thousand farmers have committed suicide. In United States, one profession which commits maximum number of suicides is the farming community. In the last twelve years, fifty percent of American farmers have not seen a single dollar of profit. All families are shooting themselves up. So, what else needs to happen for people to wake up? What else? Uh, just about seventy, eighty years ago, almost every part of the world has seen terrible famines. Famine is not fun. A bomb is better, believe me, at least it takes you. Famine is a slow fade of life. In three to four months, people die horrendous lives. In 1942, Bengal famine in India took 3.2 million people in four months. Their suffering, unfortunately, cannot be recorded and has not been anyway. There is no way you can record the suffering of human beings who see their children, their parents and everybody who's little weaker than them starts dying one by one and you are also fading away. And there have been situations in the world, in many parts of the world, where people have chopped off their children's arms and eaten it just to survive. These… I'm not saying these terrible things to scare you or to talk about a doomsday, world is going to end. No, the world is not going to end. The problem is our populations are increasing and if the food production decreases, uh, it'll be a slow fade. We always think it'll happen to somebody else, unfortunately. No, it can happen to any one of us. Right now, the nutrient loss in the food is such, like men you know, uh, World Health Organization is predicting that there will be a mental pandemic, mental illness pandemic, I'm sorry. What this means is, the coronavirus pandemic means if there is one person here who's got the infection, 
All the people sitting in this hall may get it, that's what it means, that's a pandemic. Mental illness pandemic means what? That means every one of us who is sitting in this room are susceptible to some kind of mental illness. Why is that happening? One of the biggest things is lack of micronutrients in the food. We are not eating the right kind of food. There is no strength in the life that we are. We may have muscles, that is not the strength. The essential life must be strong. When I say essential life, the life that you are is only a consequence or a reflection of what's happening in the soil. Right now the biggest crime that we are committing is, I've been talking to a whole lot of agriculture ministries in the world. What I see is, even today, well-developed developed nations are still talking about soil like it's some inert material and they're going to add this chemical and that chemical and fix it. That's not the way it is, it is a living system. It is the largest living system on the planet, not just the planet, in the known universe that we know. This is the largest living system, which is the soil. It is so complex. What is happening there, you are just a small representation of that. Even in terms of evolution, you are an outcome of what has happened in the soil. Well, will we get it now or will we get it when they bury us? That's the only option we have. If we get it now, such horrendous situations can be avoided. Will we be remembered or will we become that generation which turned back from the brink of a disaster? Or will we be that generation which slept through and fell over? This is the choice we have. I would like to see that we are that generation who is responsible enough, alert enough, who will prevent a disaster, not cry and grieve after a disaster. <laughs> but how can we do that? <laughs> uh, what can we personally do? Like, yep. what can I… I go home and what do I do? <laughs> See, you go home and in the night you start fixing your garden <laughs> instead of your hair <laughs> <laughs> And also, you know, this… people are more worried about revitalizing their hair than revitalizing the soil. Like, <laughs> that is true. You know, how can we wake them up? What… what needs to be done where everyone's so in their own bubble and… and worried about anything else. Somebody was telling me statistics that uh, the amount that is spent on neurosciences, including brain surgeries and all that, it seems the hair care products are about five times more than that. <laughs> wow. Yes. Oh. <laughs> but okay. Hair, not the head, that's the policy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you go and fix your garden today, that's very cute of you, we appreciate that <laughs> but that's not the solution. Because the problem is in the agricultural lands, seventy-one percent of the world's land is under agriculture. That's where the problem is. Why did the problem happen? How did it happen? See, if you take sand and put organic content into it, it will become soil. If you take soil and remove all the organic content, it will become sand. So, this is all we have done. We've removed all the organic content in the last twenty-five to forty years, in some countries up to hundred years, but largely in the last forty years is the maximum damage. Why did this happen? Every farmer, fifty years ago, let's say, every farmer knew he needs to have some animals on the farm, he needs some trees and other vegetation, and he understood that without the help of the soil, he cannot really grow a crop. But somewhere along the way, somebody produced a magic powder. Today you call it fertilizer, it was magic powder at one time. Somebody brought this, a bag of it and gave it to you, you threw it in your land and suddenly your crops burst forth like that. In many places, the production increased three times over. Three hundred percent increase in yield happened in many places. Because the land was already rich, a little bit of infusion of fertilizer made it like that. But since then, we forgot that 
the organisms in the soil need organic content and top of it if you add some uh, fertilizer, you will get yield. Like you're eating good food, and top of it maybe one or two vitamin pills, this, that, iron, calcium, something, if it's lacking, you take it. But now because of these pills or tablets, you felt really great tomorrow morning and you decided from tomorrow you will not eat food instead of two, you will eat two hundred tablets and you will be doing great. This is exactly what we have done to the land. We put some fertilizer and it produced results for us. Then we forgot, it can only be doctored application. It cannot be a wholesale application of fertilizer. Because of this, the farming car, the, the cost of production has been going up and going up. Almost nowhere is farmer making any money. Uh, because he's not making that, younger generation is not going for that. We've done some kind of a survey in India. Not even two percent of the farmers want their children to go into farming. Right now it's over sixty percent, not even two percent want that. See, farming means you have learned the magic of uh, turning mud into food, it's not a small thing. Uh, if uh, there are people here, young people, many of them with all kinds of qualifications, let us say you are an MBA or why, let's say you are an MSc in agriculture, you come, I'll give you ten acres of fertile soil to you, very fertile land. Five different crops, just grow it and show it to me. You will see you will be a disaster because farming is not like that. It needs meticulous application, there's an intrinsic knowledge about it. So in another twenty, twenty-five years when this generation passes, <laughs> who has the knowledge to grow food and where are we going to go? So this is happening across the world, but in some places very dramatically, in other places maybe not so much. Uh, so soil is an important part because right now people are thinking of various aspects, thinking that ma many, many problems are there. Yes, there are problems. Yes, there are issues of fossil fuel. Yes, there is pollution. All this is there. But soil is the main link in this carbon cycle of life. What we call as life is essentially the cycle of carbon. But today there are too many, what to say, online scientists or uh, WhatsApp scientists, you know? What, what, WhatsApp scientists. Yeah, yeah. They read two messages and they become scientists. Uh, and uh, they're all… if you say carbon, they'll say, oh, poison, poison. We are carbon. We are all carbon life here. Everything that you know, from a flower to fruit to man to woman to everything to everything, everything is carbon, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So this is a carbon life. What you call as life on this planet is a cycle of carbon. In this cycle or in this chain, soil is the vital link, the largest and the most vital link. That link is wearing thin. If it breaks in some way, if it becomes too weak, then the rest of the chain will start crumbling down. Every year, according to UNFAO, every year twenty-seven thousand species, I don't think it registers, twenty-seven thousand species of microbial life, both beneath the soil and above, are going extinct. Twenty-seven thousand species. Everybody is very clear, in twenty-five to thirty-five years, or twenty-five to forty years, let's say, it will come to a place where you cannot regenerate soil. So, we need to act now as a generation. This is a challenge, an opportunity and a privilege that we could turn the world around as a generation. Next and the next one will not be able to if we don't do it now. So, first and foremost thing is to enshrine soil and ecological regeneration as a part of every nation's policy. Why I'm insisting on the policy is, see today you will go and fix your garden, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. You fixed your garden, I fixed my land, somebody else did wonderful things. But this is good, it's very nice, but this is not a solution because this is what has happened. The previous generations had done farming very well, but in the last one generation, we've ripped it apart. 
So if you do it well, what is the guarantee the next generation will do it well? This is why it has to go into the policy, that this is the way to do it. Now, in this city, I don't know the loss of your city, but uh, let me put it this way, suppose you have uh, twenty-five thousand square feet of land, you cannot build twenty-five thousand square foot building. They will allow you to build fifteen or twenty thousand square feet, you have to allow some space for yourself, your neighbor, something. But in Europe, I don't know how the city is, but if you go to the old cities in Europe, you will see houses are built in such a way that there is no concept of a window, only one door, in and out through the same door. Because at that time there were no rules, everybody built whichever way they wanted, you can't change it now. So now there are laws, if you build anything more than you should build, the authorities will come and demolish it. But suppose you have hundred acres of land, you plow every inch of it, turn it into a desert in the next fifteen years' time, nobody will ask you, why have you done this? Because there's no law. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand, soil is not our property. Soil is a legacy that's come to us in its living condition. We must pass it on to that little boy of yours in a living condition. So the little girl is clapping and clapping, you better be careful. <laughs> you can… you can affect policy change in this country, that's why I'm telling you. Yeah, that's why I'm here. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So… <laughs> so do it. Um, um, a question just that I've had anyway, like, it's a good… I mean, okay. I'm not a vegan. I, I should be because I have a uh, chicken-egg intolerance. But then there is a whole different problem with vegan, uh, vegan lifestyle, right? Not vegan lifestyle, but the, 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 the farming of the, the soy and all that stuff. What's, what's your opinion about that? See, I… at this point, I'm pitching for soil policy in every nation. I am not here to tell anybody what they should eat because people can eat what is best for them. Now, people might have… or nations or cultures might have arrived at a certain type of food because at a certain time, survival was the issue. When survival was the issue, we made certain choices. Now that survival is not the issue, definitely we should make wiser and better choices. When I say wiser and better, this is not my recommendation, it's for you to experiment. See, food means it is the fuel for this body. So if you eat something, it should energize you. You… Uh, you take your car to the gas station or I take my motorcycle to the gas station, if I fill the tank, the motorcycle doesn't become lazy, boom, it'll go. But right now you're putting that kind of food into the system, if you put it, now you have to put coffee, tea, coke, something, something, one poison after another <laughs> to get it going. So there must be something not great about the food that we're eating. Yeah. So how to eat? What is the ideal food for this body? See, food is not a philosophy. Food is not a religion. Food is a practical solution for this body. In my way of looking at life, See, once you have come here as a human being, well, survival is not good enough. When survival is in question, well, it's a big deal. But once survival is taken care of, it doesn't mean anything. Something more needs to happen. Maybe people have never figured out what is that something more, but something more and something more needs to happen. In search of that something more, we're turning the planet upside down, that's all that's happening in pursuit of human happiness and well-being, this is happening. So, this aspect of what should I eat should never be approached philosophically or through religious beliefs. You must experiment and see what makes you very agile and alert. Because once you come as a human being, there are only two things to your life. One thing is 
the profoundness and pleasantness of experience. If you sit here, how profound is your experience and how pleasant is your experience? Hey, you guys, you okay? <laughs> but when it comes to activity in the world, how impactful are you? That is a concern for everybody. Your profoundness of experience and impactfulness of activity, this is all you have with your life. You may think, no, no, I want to build a family, I want to build my business, I want to build wealth, I want to build this, that, I want to do this and that. All these are efforts to create profoundness of experience. Yes? Mm -hmm. Why? Why there is so much population? Why there are so many children being born? It is the most painful thing to do in life. But still why children are born is profoundness of experience, isn't it? Even though it is horrendously painful, that is how important it is for a human being to experience something more. Why so many people are getting drunk? Why so many people, even if it kills them, they are on drugs? Profoundness of experience. Why people are fasting, going to the temple, going to this place, going to that place, however difficult it is? Profoundness of experience. A human being is always in search of little more life, in some way. Whichever way, you know, if you know body, you're trying, trying through your body. If you know mind, you're trying through your mind. If you know emotions, you're trying through that. If you know the world, you're th trying through that. But every human being, knowingly or unknowingly, in pursuit of a more profound experience, something more needs to happen, isn't it? Now, whatever can happen ever in this life for you, it can only happen within you, isn't it? Pain and pleasure happens within you, joy and misery happens within you, agony and ecstasy happens within you. But we are trying to squeeze it from outside world. This whole process is like this. See, if our body if our body becomes pleasant, we call this health. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. If our mind becomes pleasant, we call this peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. If our emotions become pleasant, we call this love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If our very life energies become pleasant, we call this bliss. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If our surroundings become pleasant, we call it success. Only to make your surroundings pleasant, you need the cooperation of the world and many other forces which are functioning in it. For pleasantness of body, pleasantness of mind, pleasantness of emotion and energy, it's one hundred percent your business. Hello? I'm overwhelmed by wisdom, uh, sorry. <laughs> so, in pursuit of pleasantness, when I say pleasantness, you can call it happiness, joy, this, that, any amount of vocab vocabulary, essentially you want your life to be pleasant. Now, many people believe life can only be good after they die. That may be true for others <laughs> depending on who you are <laughs> But <laughs> I have some terrible jokes I won't tell today. I'm I have a, a very terrible joke as well, but <laughs> I'll tell you later. I'm on a soil mission, so I won't <laughs> tell jokes. So, uh, lot of people believe, uh, you know, it's like this. We, our… I'm sorry? Hello, sir, please. Hello? Hello, please relax. It's okay. When people manufacture bombs and bullets, they have to… Unfortunately, you must know this. 
This is why I said, you want to be a regretful generation or you want to be a responsible generation. We allow… <laughs> you think all the nations which are manufacturing bombs and bullets and guns endlessly, it's the largest industry on the planet. When they're doing all this, you think they were doing it for entertainment? Hello? For entertainment, to just to store it up and show it to you, they were preparing all these missiles and bombs. They are going to use it somewhere, one or the other. They are going to use it. After World War II, which was such a horrendous experience in this part of the world, everybody felt or everybody believed with the League of Nations and United Nations, never again there's going to be another war. Since then, have we stopped one day? We've been fighting and fighting, fighting somewhere. Everybody has a good reason to fight. We thought when we crossed 2000, we thought twenty-first century is a new century, technological century, knowledge century, here we are not going to fight. How many wars since 2000? How many nations have been destroyed? Well, you need to understand, if you do not address it when it is building up, after it breaks loose, what to do? What do you do? You can sit here and shout. You can sit here and cry, but it's not going to stop. We as human beings, why so much destructive power is being built on the planet? Is this needed for us? Should we not address this in our nations, wherever we are? Well, it may not be in your power to suddenly diffuse it, but have we even thought about it? Are we thinking about it? Are we looking how at least in the next fifty years or hundred years such things don't happen? No, we're building it up and building it up. First thing is a moratorium or a ban on using new technologies for war efforts. At least that you must stop, isn't it? Please, huh? please, don't do this. So, I know death and destruction is not a pleasure for anybody. It doesn't matter whom it ha... for who it happens. But this is what I'm telling you. You need to understand, wars since 2000, please count how many wars. You can count, there's a lot of counting to do. But I want you to remind you, in Africa in the last fifty years, there have been thirty major wars. Out of these thirty wars, twenty-seven of them were fought to acquire fertile soils, fertile lands. And now you're talking about Ukraine being your breadbasket. This is what needs to change in the world. Food needs to grow where people are. It's very, very important. Otherwise, in one way or the other, it'll be exploited at some point. Above all, the most important thing is, right now as a generation of people, we are largely whatever kind of democracies, we are some kind of democracy across the world largely. What this means is, people are the power. It has not happened. The soil aspects have not happened. Yesterday or day before when I was in London, Lord Billy Moria was saying, there's a candid video of him speaking, he was saying that he was at the COP26 for one and a half weeks out of two weeks and addressed more than thirty gatherings there, thirty events he spoke. Mm -hmm. He said, I did not hear the word soil in COP26. This is his statement. Why are we avoiding it? When forty percent of the global warming is because of soil, why is it we are not talking about it? All of you young people must research and see why. There must be some good reason, isn't it? Why are we avoiding it? But at the same time, in the last two years, I've been talking to various scientists across the world, decision makers, officers in various positions, Agriculture ministries, 
just everybody knows soil is the serious problem on the planet. And largely everybody knows what is the direction of the solution. They may not know the details of the solution, but most people know the direction in which it needs to go. So when I look at it, two years, wherever I speak, everybody says, Yes, Sadhguru, this is the most important Sadhguru, this needs to happen, please do it, Sadhguru. And I just thought, everybody knew what's the problem and everybody knows generally what is the solution. It looks like they were just waiting for an idiot to bell the cat. And here I am. You've been saying this for many, 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 many years. Twenty-five years I've been speaking non-stop about this. <laughs> so... So I guess that's the good thing about technology and internet and... Yes, that is a good thing. We can thing. use this. <clears throat> People keep asking me, Sadhguru, why? Why are you doing this now? Why such a risk you're taking for yourself? Yes, yes, uh, we're... Uh, you know, I'm... Uh, People were wearing me, were asking me, Sadhguru, why are you wearing sunglasses inside? I said, this is my invitation to the sun through northern Europe. I will wear sunglasses through day and night so that sun is out every day <laughs> because... because I see... I see roads and two wheels are not friends. Yes, <laughs> they're not, they don't go well. So, uh, this is that important. Enormous destruction has happened, deserts are spreading, everything is happening. People are always trying to divert it to something else. I am not saying people are... people of Ukraine are not important. Every people are important, whatever kind they are, wherever they are. Every life is important, every grasshopper is important, every earthworm is important. Every life, every bird, every plant, every microbial life is important. So important that without us, the planet will flourish. Without them, there cannot be anything growing here, all right? I must tell you this, eighty percent of the biomass insects have disappeared in the last seventy years, eighty percent, okay? Sixty-seven percent of vertebrate life on this planet is gone. Over ninety-two percent of freshwater life is gone. What is our plan? What is our plan? We need to understand this. We may be top of the pile in terms of evolutionary development, but if all of us disappear, planet will flourish. If all of them disappear, planet will wither away in many ways. So, I was, you know, I was uh, flying a helicopter in Tennessee, a small little craft, which is kata kata kata, you know, not the proper ones. <laughs> so, uh, weather was good and so we pulled out the doors, uh, you know, those the small helicopters, you can take off the doors. We took off the doors and we went up. Then, most of you know this, every thousand feet that you go, a drop of, you know, one degree centigrade will happen. We just at like five, five thousand, five hundred feet. But we got a cold, uh, you know, a cold wave kind of thing and suddenly it was freezing cold up there. So even holding the controls was tough, so we thought we'll come down. As we're coming down, we were just talking, suppose the sun doesn't come up tomorrow, what'll happen? And then we started guessing, maybe in another six months this will happen, that will happen, maybe you don't have to make ice creams, you can make it anywhere on the street and <laughs> some nonsense, we were talking like this. <laughs> then I came down and I just looked it up and it says, in eighteen hours, if sun doesn't come up or sun disappears, in eighteen hours' time, almost everything that you know as life on this planet will be gone. Eighteen hours. And I just looked this further. 
If all the insects die on this planet, in about two and a half to four years, all life on the planet will go away. If all the worms disappear, in one and a half to two years' time, all the life on this planet will go away. Worms, if the microbial life goes away completely, planet will end within a few hours. Because sixty percent of your body itself is microbes, only forty percent is, uh, you know, parental genetics. I will tell this to your boy. Because then he will say, Mom, you're just twenty percent, you don't tell me all this <laughs> So, this very body is full of microbial life. Today we understand without gut microbiome, you cannot even digest the food that you eat. So, do not argue about, do I become vegan, do I eat this, do I eat that? It is just that, we just have to pay attention to the body. The problem is right now there is no attention, there is too much information. Everybody knows what is the Galaxy Z63 doing right now, because it came in the WhatsApp, <laughs> all right <laughs> But they don't know what's happening here. So it's not just about the body, it goes further, but at least on the level of your body, if you pay attention, if you put something into your body, if you pay attention, you will know what it does to you. See, food appears in front of me. If I just place my hands over it, I'll decide whether to eat it or not, because I know whether this should go into me or not go into me. Mm -hmm. So one aspect of his health and well-being, but the most important aspect of this for a yogi is perception, because only what you perceive, you know. If you do not perceive, all you can do is imagine, inform, Im information, imagination, this will not take you anywhere. You need to perceive life more profoundly than what you're perceiving right now. Only then your life will become more profound. If you have a lot of information, your life will not become more profound. It's happening right now. Tell me, on this planet right now, educated people are more eco-friendly in the way they live or uneducated and illiterate people are more eco-friendly? You're asking me? <laughs> we are the ones who are talking to each other. <laughs> no. <But may> I... <laughs> Fair enough. It's okay. It's Fair okay. enough. <laughs> no, no, no. Go I ahead. said it's okay. I'm just. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, uh, is this a sign? Yeah, uh, saved by the bell. Um, I'm sure there's other people in this room that have oh. very uh, intelligent questions. Um, shall we? Shall we invite them? Yeah. You're the boss. I okay, said. I'm the boss. Does anyone have an intelligent question, or just a question at all? Yeah, this man in front. I have a question. Please take the microphone. Oh, yeah. First of all, thank you so much for this message and all this it is uh, for what you're sharing. So thank you so much. You took over half of everybody. Please, a little, uh, little water, water. What? What has been that we water the soil that you're so passionate about and we're sharing here, but what, why is that like not talked about as much and how can we incorporate it to, to do even better? Thank you. So, uh, is water, air important? Yes. See, it's like this. If you don't eat for eight to ten days, you could start dying. If you do not drink water for six to seven days, you could be dead. But if you do not breathe for two minutes, you could be dead. Hello? Mm -hmm. 
So what is the priority? Air, water, soil, food is soil, water is water, air is breath. But it's very wrong to look at them separately because it's one cycle, one tremendous life energy happening there. We are looking at everything keyhole, water, air, this, that. Let me tell you this. The soil on the planet can hold eight times or eight hundred percent more water than all the rivers on the planet put together. That's where it should be. If the organic content is very rich, that's where it would be. See, if you go into a rainforest or any thick jungle, not with any implement, with just with your fingers, if you dig like this three, four inches, it'll be damp. That means it's humid, there is water in the soil. That's how it should be and that's all your crop needs. But now we are irrigating. To what extent? I do not know the stats about uh, Netherlands, but let me tell you the stats about India. India is using eighty-four percent of its groundwater and every other surface water we have for agriculture to feed 1.3 billion people. But if you enhance the organic content in the soil, let's say to eight to ten percent, your irrigation requirement would come down to thirty percent of what we are using right now. That is… see that needs… the little girl says… <laughs> if you're using hundred liters of water, it can come down to thirty liters. Or if you raise the organic content to twelve to fifteen percent, your irrigation requirement will come down to ten to fifteen percent. That is, hundred liters could be shrunk to fifteen liters. Anyway, water is not a problem because water is not gone anywhere. Thousand years ago, how much water we had in this planet, we still have. Or do you think some water escaped to Mars or Venus or something? <laughs> Nothing like that happened. Water is still here, it is just may not be where you need it right now. It's somewhere else because water can exist in all the three states. It is here, there, somewhere else, not where you want. Or you're in the wrong place <laughs> Any one of them <laughs> So, this has been going on, uh, you know, in India there is a whole movement of people wanting to divert the Indian rivers and connect them and grow paddy and rice everywhere they want, sugar cane, paddy, they want to grow wherever they want. I have been warning them for the last thirty years. Uh, this government is little listening and controlled that aspiration, otherwise many governments won elections based on that promise we will bring Ganga water to Kaveri. That means that which is flowing in the northern India will bring that water all the way to southern India. You can grow as much rice as you want and reproduce as much as you want. Well, I will tell you, in a tropical country where average temperature in India is around thirty-three degrees, at that temperature, if water travels hundred kilometers, the evaporation rate is over seventy percent. And tropical lands are thirsty. The leakages in the canals will take away the rest. And if you link these rivers, these rivers are so fantastic, they may be just fifty kilometers away, but their whole ecosystem is different. The animal life in that is very different. There are dolphins in our rivers, freshwater dolphins, okay? Nowhere else in the world probably it's there, but that's only in one river. If you connect that river and this river, don't think dolphins will be everywhere. There will be no dolphin left, that's what will happen. So, and above all, there is… because India is a peninsula like this, these rivers should flow into the ocean at least substantial quantity. Because if I say fifty percent, nobody will listen. Just I'm requesting at least twenty-five percent must flow to the ocean. I have been talking to various chief ministers, most of our rivers are east flowing. West flowing rivers, because the mountains are close to the western uh, border or western uh, coast, they quickly get into the ocean, you can't do anything about it, most of them, they just get into the ocean quickly. The east flowing rivers flow across the country. 
Now every state wants to use the water, they're… they're openly saying, leaders openly saying, I will make sure not a drop is wasted in the ocean. Well, water going into the ocean is not a waste because in this peninsula, there is a buffer of mixed water or fresh water and marine water. That buffer is very vital. Wherever we have lost that buffer, it has already happened, marine ingress happens, that is, salt water will enter the land. Looking at the terrain and the rock structure of India, up to hundred kilometers inside it can enter. Our coastline is seven thousand four hundred kilometers. Hundred kilometers inside means seven thousand into hundred, seven thousand four hundred into hundred, literally one third of the nation will be lost to marine ingress. But we want to use every drop of water because stupid human beings believe the whole world is about them. Are there uh, any other questions? Uh, raise your hands and there will be a microphone uh, near you. We have a right to live. Yeah. <laughs> so does every life on the planet has a right to live. I'm sorry. Thank you very Hello. much for your talk, Sadhguru. We had a chance to meet this Namaskar, morning. Sadhguru. Um, I very much agree for what you're saying. I would like to add something. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a uh, hundred billion animals, and we feed these animals uh, with grains, which grow on fertile land. And um, we should use this land for growing crops for humans. Uh, do you agree with that, that we can uh, improve the food situation on the earth when we use uh, arable land for growing crops for uh, people and have uh, animals on um, land, uh, marginal grounds or, or rest feed? Thank uh, you. You're a lawmaker and uh, thank you for being here. And if I… if I say what you're wanting me to say, all the steak eaters will make a steak out of me. Anyway, uh, you know, I'm not known to bake or back off from troubles, so he's getting me into it. <laughs> but well, he said what he wants. Thank you so much. Is there another question? No, no, maybe? I I'll answer that question. <laughs> you want to still answer? I'm sorry. You want, do you want to ask something? No, I will. I said I don't back off from troubles, this is why I am. <laughs> so right now, right now, fifty-one million square kilometers of land is being used for agriculture on this planet. Out of which, out of which, forty million square kilometers of land is used to raise animals and their feed. Please, does it sink into you? Seventy-seven percent of the agricultural lands are mainly used either for raising animals or their feed, okay? And uh, leave the ecological concerns, every doctor in the world is telling you with red meat, your health care bills are as high as they are mainly because of what you're eating. The headquarters for most of your chronic ailments is in your stomach, yes? It's also slowly shifting to your head, that's another matter <laughs> But uh, most of the ailments are because of the way we are eating and what we are eating. So, one aspect of this is, you don't have an animal at home and you are not going to slaughter it and eat fresh meat. It is processed, it's kept somewhere, one week, two weeks, four weeks, many of them three months later you're eating, this will cause enormous amount of trouble for the human body. I will not go into the details, gory details of that, but some other day I'll come here just to talk about food. <laughs> that day <laughs> we will do that. But I'm saying if, 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 everybody consumes fifty percent less meat consumption, 
twenty million square kilometers of land will be free. If, 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 at least forty percent of your diet comes from trees, well, in temperate climates, you have only fruits. In tropical climates, we have both fruits and vegetables which come from trees. So if forty percent of your diet comes from trees, you will see your health care bills will come down minimum by fifty to seventy percent of the nation and of the individual. Right now, for example, the most affluent nation on the planet, United States, spends 3.2 or 3.25 trillion, trillion dollars as health care for 350 million people. India's economy is not yet that much, it's somewhere close to that, but for 1.3 billion people. So why is it… see, affluence means this. Why does an individual person seek affluence or why does a society seek affluence? Initially, it is a question of nourishment. See, if you are getting… what's your currency? I'm sorry? Currency. Euros. Euro, okay, I'm sorry. So let us say you're earning only ten euros per day. I know you don't, but I'm just saying. You're earning ten euros per day and you're eating just whatever meagerly meals that were there. Then your dream is if I earn twenty euros per day, I can eat better. This is an aspiration within the human being. So initially, it is a question of better nourishment. Later, it is a question of variety of lifestyles that people choose. This is why affluence is sought after both by individuals, societies and nations. So the most affluent nation on the planet, which has a whole variety of choices of nourishment and enormous choices about lifestyle, spends 3.25 trillion dollars on health care for 350 million people, that is a statement on what you're eating. <laughs> so, can we now go on to the next question? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, the woman in the green over there, she's right. yeah! Sorry, I have so much energy, always. The question is going to be very simple. Um, I don't threaten us like that, just tell the question <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I don't have many followers, I don't have m much of money. I'm going home and I'm thinking, what is the thing I can do for this? What is the thing I can do to help to save the soil? Let's say I have no garden, I have no many friends, there is only 20 people watching me on in Instagram, so not really point. What can I actually do? You said uh, you have so much energy. <laughs> we could definitely use that. Well, do whatever, in your neighborhood, do a jig. <laughs> Initially, people will think, what's wrong with her? <laughs> After some time, kids will come and dance with you. Tell them, just go and tell your parents, they must talk about this. Go to a school and do the jig, they will love you. The adults have become like this. If they look at this person, what race is he, what religion is he, what nationality is he, what nonsense is he, you know, we are looking at every damn way to see how we can separate one human being from the other. You can call it a nation, you can call it a race, you can call it religion, you can call it caste, creed, class, philosophy, ideology, but one way or the other, we are trying to find somehow ways of splitting up people. Once you do this, conflict is just a step away. Hello? Conflict is just a step away. When will it happen? It will happen sometime. And organized conflict, it's not like two people fought. It's going to be 
my group versus your group, my nation versus your nation, my religion versus your religion, my race versus your race. Oh, this is a massive fight, all right? It's been happening, happening, happening. So right now, soil is one unifying force. You may not understand the cosmic consciousness, how it unites the whole universe. Believe that, it's far away. At least you understand, this very body that you carry is soil. We eat off the soil. When we die, we go back to the soil. The only point is, will we get it now or when we bury it? This is all the point. So once you have gotten the point, and if you have energy, as you said, There's nothing as too much, huh? When it comes to energy, there's nothing like too much. If… if you have lot of energy, you may have lot, but it's not too much, it's never too much. Because <laughs> as uh, you know, life is just this, a combination of time and energy. You have certain amount of time, certain amount of energy, yes? What else do you have? As you sit here, time is slipping away for all of us at the same speed. I can't say, I am a yogi, let me slow down my time <laughs> It doesn't work like… work like that. I have been uh, petitioning for a long time to give me a few extra hours per day. <laughs> no response <laughs> Only twenty-four hours and it goes at the same speed. In your experience, you can slow it down or hasten it. See, on a certain day, you're very joyful. Twenty-four hours went off like a moment. Another day, you're a little depressed. One day feels like a year or a eon, depends on how depressed you are. <laughs> so, time is a relative experience in that sense. So now, you need to understand the only way you can make your life impactful and effective is to enhance the energy because time, nothing you can do, it just rolls. For everybody, as you see, from the time you came here, from the time I came here and sat here, all of us are about an hour and a half closer to our graves. <laughs> yes, it's a fact, you better know this. If you… if you know this, if you know this, you will organize your life in a sensible manner. If you do not do the… if you do not know this, you will do silly things which don't mean a damn thing to you or to anybody around you, simply all kinds of things. If you really knew you're racing towards your grave, do you have time to get angry with somebody, quarrel with somebody, do some nonsense with somebody, wage a war with somebody? Do you have time for all these things? People come and tell me, Sadhguru, this enemy, I can't bear him, what to do? I said, hey, just wait or he will die <laughs> You don't have to do anything, you just wait, either he will die or you will die. Both ways the problem will be solved. So now you have lot of energy. Time is very limited, so how to employ it? Well, each human being has to do it in their own way. So you don't have social media following, ah, oh, link up with somebody. Um, there is… am I getting it right? Yes. Ah, I got it. I was afraid I'll say her name wrong. I won't try his <laughs> So. Uh, I'm sure Karis has a following, link up to that and every day say, save soil, do something, pick up one one fact from the website and keep saying it. People will think you're a soil scientist in three days <laughs> And I will tell Karis to retweet you if you tweet something sensible, huh? I'm saying go and request people, I'm saying at this time if you don't talk to people, at this time if you're shy of doing something, I am telling you, in twenty years' time, we will be a very regretful generation. Please, let's not go there.
the good day make you also a very sad guru. Right? No. That's my joke. That was my joke. I wanted to put <laughs> That's that... That's not a joke. I wanted to die that all That's not a joke. <laughs> uh, that was Are you a joke. sad guru? Sad guru means an uneducated guru. <laughs> that doesn't mean sad. <laughs> Just tell me. <laughs> Generally, most educated people, you usually are in the universities. If you go into the universities, I see such long faces, you know. <laughs> I was speaking at the Princeton University. If I tell them a joke, they agree with me <laughs> Whatever I do. Then I say, why are all these people, except uh, about four or five people, uh, young people, boys and girls who are like in their early twenties, all of us are <laughs> like this. I said, why are all these people over thirty years of age have carrying such long faces? What's the matter? Then one lady stands up and seriously says, they're all married <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's… Uh, I think it's about time for Maybe the last or maybe two questions, that depends on the length of your answer, so I, I think it will be the last question. Um, there's like the balcony uh, and people can raise their hand as well because there's a microphone. There's a yeah, little okay. girl here also. The there is girl. one, I don't know if it's a girl. Those are in the upper regions, please. Those are in the upper regions of… Uh, yeah. There's a little five-year-old here. The mic is coming. Please, we give the mic to her? Yeah, but let first let her do the question. Yeah, I don't know if this is going to interfere. No, no, it won't. Oh, no. I have something for you. Yes, ma'am. I have this for you. Oh. What to do? I have to come and take this, right? <laughs> Ooh. Oh, this is a Pista show, it's just for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. How did you know I need some nourishment right now? <laughs> okay, that's the question. Yes. Yes. Hello, Namaskaram Sadhguru. Where are you? I'm here. Over here. Up here. There Up. Upstairs. Upstairs. Oh. In the light. Yeah, yeah. Hello. <laughs> um, I have a question. You've been speaking um, a lot about the big things that need to change in the world, considering this problem, soil. So the big impact is going to happen with the big players. But my question is about where is the balance between individual responsibility and uh, the uh, responsibility of the big um, companies, governments. So my question is, is basically, is it just as valid to invest my energy in um, making directly soil better by, for example, buying land and learning how to farm properly? Or is it better to invest my energy in changing the big players in the world, um, which is not something in my direct control, but of course, since we are a democracy, it's, uh, so, there's some kind of influence. So my question is, how, mm -hmm. how to manage this balance between individual responsibility and the, the big companies that have a big role in things? Yes. Uh, if, you, if that lock is about uh, locking up your heart, you must unlock that, you know? This one. This the is the, the Dialinga pendant. <laughs> so I'm not on luck, I'm open, I'm okay, free. That's good. So, uh, see, um, right now uh, the situation is this. I didn't want to tell you this, but now you ask this question. So in the last ten days, we have already six nations from the Caribbean region signing up for the soil regeneration program. And 
Another... Another eight nations are on the way. In the next probably couple of weeks that'll happen. And uh, just in the last twenty-four hours, we have the Commonwealth nations coming on board. Commonwealth... Uh, the office of the Commonwealth has come forward and said, they will enroll into this process of soil regeneration. There are fifty-four nations in this commonwealth and So these fifty-four nations account for 2.5 billion people on the planet. That's the population of these nations. So they are coming through and there is a Chogam uh, meeting... No, that's not an eatable. And the Chogam is a conference, okay? <laughs> that's not a food, I'm saying. <laughs> Sounds like that <laughs> So there is a conference in Rwanda. When I'm completing my hundred days there in that conference in Rwanda. And before that, on the 10th of May, I will be in Ivory Coast where COP15 meeting is happening. That is under the aegis of uh, UNCCD, that is the UN Agency for Combating Desertification. One hundred and seventy nations are participating. I'm speaking there and uh, the Secretary General of UNCCD is one hundred percent with this. They have come on board with us after seeing the success of Kaveri calling, how we have implemented this on the ground, large scale. So, most probably, all these one seventy nations will move in that direction. The question of... the real question or the problematic question is the pace. Which country will move at what pace? This pace depends on... one thing is the determination of the individual nation's leadership and another is the economic conditions of a given nation and another is certain agricultural practices or traditions which are already there which are some of them are very disruptive. Touching them with large segments of population could be a political issue for some of the national leaders. Another thing is the distractions. Right now, EU, you are part of EU, EU has postponed regenerative agricultural measures which they were about to announce in the next two months by two years because of Ukraine. Well, Ukraine, unfortunately, what's happening is happening. You don't have to stop this, but now this is postponed because in many ways this is all it takes. A little distraction and we will postpone vital actions that are needed on the planet. Continuously this has been happening, not today. It's been happening for twenty, thirty years. Every nation, just one excuse, they will postpone it. One excuse, they will postpone it. I think the people who live here must put a little pressure that you don't have to postpone it by two years because there is an Ukrainian war. Yes, it's a unfortunate situation, but that's got nothing to do with this. We are still eating, we are still breathing, hello? We are doing everything else, but vital things that we need to do, we won't do. We must do, it's very important, especially now that a lot of food was coming from that country and now because of that war and disruption, maybe I don't know how many years it will take for that country to recoup because in... I'll... I'll forgive twentieth century because twentieth century was full of blundering idiots, they had two world wars and endless number of wars all over the world. We thought twenty-first century will be free from that. But nations which have been bombed out in twenty-first century are nowhere near recovery after eight, ten, twelve years' time. Hello? Yes or no? Nowhere near recovery at all. So, probably this also is the same story. It will not recover just like that because once you destroy everything that people have, disrupt people's lives, they coming back and boom, building it back, is not like that. A nation cannot be built like that. So this is very important, we don't move towards destruction. Once you move, building back is not an overnight job. That goes for soil also. 
If you destroy soil like he was quoting in the beginning, one inch of soil to create one inch of soil, it takes five hundred years. Uh, what is your lifespan, I would like to know? Fifty-two percent of the world's top soil is gone already, you know. Thirty percent of United States' top soil is gone, thirty percent. Gone, gone, not there. Where did it go? You've heard about the dust balls in United States, the, the dust bowls, hmm? So massive, millions and millions of tons of soil took off because these are very fragile prairie lands. These are the United States, the western part of United States is a large-scale grassland, very fragile. Only when those grasses were there, when animals were there, this was managed. The moment you started plowing, the winds blow very, very hard in this region because it's a plain land without any mountain structures, nothing. From the ocean it just blows. So when this happened, millions of tons of soil landed in New York City. So people are still talking about it. So I was uh, there and I was… somebody was saying, I don't remember the number, they said some millions of tons of sand and soil ended up in New York City. I said, see, you are only calculating the amount of soil that gathered and your problems of clearing that soil from New York City. The soil stopped here because of tall buildings and lot of construction. But what about maybe hundred or thousand times more soil which went and landed in Atlantic? It definitely would have, right? A city stopped a little bit of it, which is humongous amount. But what was not stopped, what went into the ocean is a countless amount of soil. So that is, in that we lost thirty percent of the soil of a nation of that size. So, this is… there are excuses and excuses. So about your question, she is individual, should I buy land, fix it, don't, don't go that way. I have done plenty of that, still doing. Kaveri Calling is operative in eighty-three thousand square kilometers, five-point-two million farmers live and work here. These… this kind of work kills you, okay? Really, you have to raise funds and raise funds and raise funds, planting trees, organizing people, endlessly. It goes on and on. Last twenty-five years, in various forms it's been happening. Oh, we've just planted, uh, what is this, last year, about sixty-seven million trees, living trees. But no, no, no. See, we have removed billions and billions of trees. Now sixty-seven million trees don't need a clap. It needs a slap. <laughs> but this is all we can do, unfortunately. So I'm telling you, this is why it entering the government policy is most vital because only if it's in the policy, the government machinery leans in that direction. The budgets of the nations will lean in that direction. Only then real things will happen. If you do individually, you may do it for your satisfaction, but it will never be a solution. If industries and business do it, they will do it little large scale, they could set… set very large scale good examples like we are setting up good examples, <coughs> but it still will be only an example. Not that it does not do any good, it does lot of good, but it's not a global solution. Right now we are at a point where there is no time for these kind of projects and stuff. We need a clear policy change. The only policy we are asking is how you do it. We are not telling any government, we are just suggesting these are all the hundred different ways in which you can regenerate your soil. But the only thing we are asking is to pass on soil in its living condition for next generation. That means minimum three to six percent organic content must be there in the soil before you and me die. Hello? All over the… all over the world. It's getting very serious. Can I tell them a joke? Is it okay? Maybe some famous last words? Yeah, it's the end of the huh? evening. Maybe you have some famous last words? 
Yeah. So okay. Jokes are also good ideas there. <laughs> you want to say? No, no, no. I, I did my joke. I had. I had, this, I had. <laughs> this happened in 2060. No. A few scientists sought appointment with God. They got it and they went there and they said, Hey old man, you done pretty well with creation. But today everything that you can do, we can also do. It's time you retire. God said, Oh, is that so? What is it that you can do? They dug up a little soil, made it into a vague shape of a human child and did all kinds of things and in a few minutes, the child made those noises, <laughs> okay? She see that, that girl is providing me background <laughs> The child came alive. God said, that's very impressive, but first get your own soil <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sadhguru Karishmanaja, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. So, this is a big thing, it's just uh, day two of this well, great trip we're going to do uh, and, and there is like an anthem for uh, the next couple of... So, this is, only, this is only day two, another ninety-eight days of ride is there. In case I don't make it, the young people here, you must walk these thirty thousand kilometers and make it happen. That's the story. And can you tell us something about the, then we were going to watch like a small video about, about the anthem, is that like the music for you? This soil anthem uh, has made so many musicians around the world are making their own pieces, but uh, those things did not come in time. So we just, the in-house group, we just got together and made this simple tune. I think right now it's reverberating around the world. Just make sure it falls into every year, every human year at least, don't disturb the others. Thank you so much and thank you so much for your time and listening. Uh, it's really time to make a picture, we do it in both ways so you can share and talk about soil because if that's what we learned uh, well, the last couple of minutes is let's talk about it and share the love of the soil and uh, share it on social media, savesoul.org is the uh, mm -hmm. website. Hey, give me all the La la la